Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number four of the Progress Report, a weekly program about economic development and local government in and around Green Bay and Brown County. I'm your host, Bill Mindel. A big thank you to Political Radar for creating, sponsoring, and producing this new show. June 14th, 2001. That was a big day for Brown County. That's when the new Brown County Jail and Juvenile Detention Facility opened. $38 million, 13 pods, 750 beds all told. The new jail replaced an older, smaller county jail located downtown on Courthouse Square. That decision two decades ago to build a new jail and to relocate it did not come easy. It followed years of debate and controversy. Fast forward to 2018 and the Brown County Jail facility is back in the news. The new jail on county property on Green Bay's northeast side is at operational capacity. It's full. 40 or more inmates a day are being transported to other facilities outside Brown County. So it's time for jail expansion, so says the county. Here to talk about the jail expansion, its size, its cost, and is it really needed, is Brown County Sheriff John Gossage. Hello, John, and welcome to the Progress Report. Hello, Bill. Thanks for having me. Glad you're here. About the county jail, John, what are some of the important basics to know about the current facility? Well, the current facility has two, two modes of uh, operation or pod systems because they're all drop-in pods. So you can add pods or, or take them out if, if you would need be. But these pod systems are either a direct supervision or indirect supervision. The difference between the two, the direct supervision, the officer is in and amongst the inmates. It's almost like a dormitory-type setting. And then when we speak about indirect Pods. That is when they're in their the inmates are in their individual cells and being monitored from a uh, a desk, if you will, that is uh, secured from the inmates. So they so don't you have, have both both types of we pods. We have both types of pods. Correct. It was opened in two thousand and one. It's located at thirty thirty Curry Lane on Green Bay's northeast side. That is correct. And there are thirteen pods. There are thirteen pods, and of those, there's four of, of the direct supervision or the dormitory type pods. The rest of the pods are the uh, indirect. So for those more violent offenders that we have in there, the indirect modology is the best type of uh, setting for those individuals versus the dormitory where somebody can uh, assimilate themselves with the, the inmate client. You've partially answered this already, but yeah. what, what exactly is a pod? A pod is basically, it's, it's, it's one area where the inmates are kept. So in hotel pod, for example, we keep all of our females in that because we have to have them sites down separate from the, from the male population, as well as our um, juvenile population. Those also have to be sight sound different from the adult population. So we have challenges in and amongst on where we move individuals. We also have a classification system that looks at the individual inmate and determines what is best for that inmate, whether they would be able to assimilate in a direct supervision versus an indirect based on their mental health, maybe AODA issues that they have. So the county jail is men, it's women, and it's juveniles, and they're separated. Of yes, course. sir. Yes, sir. Not to stray off topic here, but why is the Brown County Jail located where it is? Brown County's criminal justice system physically is spread out. The courthouse, for example, is in downtown Green Bay. The DA's office and the county work release center are also downtown. The jail is on the city's northeast side, and the sheriff's department is headquartered in Bellevue. Right. Uh, the jail, when that expansion went on, I think they wanted to try to build it downtown, but they just didn't have the land or the space to be able to do that. Okay. Um, so the determination was made by then the county leaders to look at that land that they had available out by uh, UWGB or that Curry Lane facility, and uh, that seemed to be the best option at the time. It does bring some challenges for us with regard to bringing inmates to the court, uh, but we do have uh, a methodology by which we, we accomplish that. Must be a fair amount of transporting back and forth between downtown and the jail and there the is sheriff's department. There is. We did um, uh, occur some costs or incur some costs on that when when that was uh, when that was built out there. Um, so it does. It, depending upon the court schedule, there's numerous trips that are made back and forth, and uh, in the case uh, very similar to what we're having with our homicide trial. That individual is, uh, we're keeping him down to the work release center so we don't have to bring him back and forth uh, to the Curry Lane Jail. Is there any advantage, John, to having the jail located next to the Brown County Community Treatment Center? Uh, you know, there, there is in that um, 
if there's somebody that does have some kind of ideations of any suicidal tendencies, we can then bring them over to that that facility. Um, but it would still re- require that we have two officers come and transport that individual over to the CTC. So, I mean, th- there is some, you know, economies of scale there, if you will. Sure. Um, really, when you look at it, I think they've got their own food service program because they have to um, based on what their rec- their requirements are. Um, but, you know, the laundry, those services could all be combined. And, of course, the community treatment center is what used to be known as the Brown County Mental Health Center. That's correct, yes. And originally they were going to where the old mental health center was. It's been raised but they were going to use the facilities for the jail for the laundry and the meal service for that, for the uh, mental health or the uh, BCTC, if it was going to remain in the same area that it was, but uh, they moved that. They moved that. Yeah. What percent of ca- capacity are you operating at today with the jail? How many inmates on average are you transporting outside the county because of a shortage of space, and where are those inmates going? Yeah, that's a great question. We... Um, we have to triage that every day. And what we, what we do is I task my staff to take a look at how many people, how many walk-ins we have because judges order people to walk in and report to jail. So they know that number. They know how many people are coming from the state prisons to come in for writs that have to go before the circuit court um, on, on other charges or potential other charges. So they take a look at those. They take a look at releases. And then they also take a look at what the dates are for uh, the employees, or excuse me, the inmates that are being transported out so we don't have somebody that has to come back on a court date. So not, you know, we transport them to out of Gamey, and then we have to bring them back two days later for a trial. So we, we, have, to, we have to manage that. Right now we're at about 93% capacity okay. in our facility, and we are at um, 43 inmates that we have shipped out. I believe there's four inmates that are shipped out to Green Lake County. There's 33 in out of Gamey, and I believe we have six in excuse me, 33 in Oconto, six in Outagamie, four in Green Lake County. So this is a daily occurrence where you're shipping, no, I shouldn't say ship, but transporting inmates to other counties. We are. We're transporting, and we uh, have a contracted service that we contract with, so they're not deputies that are doing that, but it's a Wisconsin lock and load that transports those inmates for us. Was there any a time when the new jail opened up that it was big enough that it had extra space that it was taking inmates from other counties to come here? Yes, absolutely. We, uh, when that jail was first built, uh, it wasn't at capacity, so we were able to take that. And it, it, that, that's a great point. When you take a look at O'Connell County, they just built their facility, and we have 33 of the Brown County inmates that are in O'Connell County. So Sheriff Jansen, who's running that operation, is now able to at least get some revenue for O'Connell County and assist in paying for that jail. Sure. What's the breakdown? What's in terms of percentage? How many jail inmates, female inmates, and juvenile uh, inmates are there in the jail? Yeah, another good question. I don't know the exact breakdown of the females, but I can give you a, a fairly good snapshot of what we were at today. Um, we do have four of the females that are shipped out to uh, Green Lake because we're at 43 females that are occupying a 44-bed f- pod. So we've got four females that are in, in Green Lake County right now. Um, and as far as the adults, adult males, there, there are quite a few of those as well. Um, I don't have the, um, the juvenile information here. I can tell you that in, uh, we've got 15 beds that are occupied in Kilo Pod. That's where our, our juvies are at. Mm-hmm. We also could have some shipped out to Sheboygan County um, because we have to ship when we have an overabundance of juveniles. We have to ship them out as well because we, we did a transformation um, to allow for more adult males to be in our facility, in, our, in one of our pods. Sure. So we, we had juvenile, uh, our Juliet pod, which was our juvenile pod, and that pod holds um, 35 beds. Um, it wasn't efficient for us to run with 15 juveniles in that and having 20 vacant beds because I can't put adults in there. So what we did was we moved the juveniles over to Kilo pod which has 15 beds in it, and then we're able to better manage that smaller juvenile population that we have. Right now you're set up to handle 44 women and 35 juveniles? Um, no, no. Today, as today's date, 15 juveniles and uh, 44 females. So just to round it out, would you say something like 80% of the inmate population is male, 15, males, yes. 15% is female, 5% is female, or yes. whatever the numbers are? Yeah, I, I would I would say that yeah the juvenile population is the lesser, so we're probably about fifteen. 
it could spike as high as a 2025 at times. And then when we have that incidence, we take that down to Sheboygan County or contract that out. And then we end up paying for those juvenile bed days at another facility because we can't accommodate that. And I also have other counties that are wanting to house juveniles in my jail as they did before because we used to contract with other counties sure. for that. How much is set aside in the Brown County budget this year for transporting prisoners, inmates to other counties? Uh, this year for 2018, we averaged 50 inmates a day at $40. So that was $730,000 is what we set aside for boarding prisoners. And we've seen that spike as far as last year. Uh, we had roughly 80 to 90 uh, inmates that were shipped out at any given time during the summertime. There's an ebb and a flow of when we start seeing um, the inmate population increase. And it's usually around the summertime. That it kicks up, huh? Yes. This year it was around August, September, and it really never ebbed back to, uh, to where it should be. It stayed consistent through November and December. So we were, um, it, was, it was somewhat concerning for us. How is the juvenile section similar or different from the adult section? The juvenile section has more programming. It's, it has more opportunities for the uh, kids to interact with uh, counselors, with teachers, um, and, and more programming for that individual. The adult uh, male population is such that it's pretty much set up for just housing, and then there's, there's some other program rooms that are available. But for the most part, it's just uh, basically cells. And one more question on the juveniles. What's the age range of the juveniles for boys and girls? The age range can uh, go anywhere from we've had as young as a 12, 13-year-old individual in there up to 16 years of age that we okay. house in there. And I know there's some legislation out there that could exacerbate that condition. Um, with this in the, in the um, assembly in the, in the Senate right now at, in, the, at, in Madison, and that is the 17-year-olds would be relegated to the juvenile facility. If that's the case, we have at any given time our 17-year-olds about 110 cases annually that we have of 17 year olds that are brought into the into the juve, or the, the adult facility the changes would have to be made so there'd be a change there'd be a flip from 110 um, cases going into the juvenile which would really exacerbate the uh, conditions that we have with the juvies now john you county executive troy streckenbach and the majority of supervisors on the county board support expanding the current jail why is that well i think they they took a look at the uh the facts that i had presented to the county board in uh, 2016 and indicated that, hey, this is some of the issues that we have going on with our jail. And at some point, we're going to need to build out. And I think it was um, kind of an eye-opening experience. I, not even I wanted to build out. I still don't want to if I don't have to. The problem is, is there's really nowhere to go with these inmates. And it, we're not seeing a recession in the amount of inmates that we have. Uh, at any given time, the district attorney has admittedly 3,000 cases that are sitting on his desk that have not been adjudicated as of yet in Brown County. That's incredible. So that's another 3,000 cases. I asked uh, District Attorney David Lassay, I said, are these cases that you would normally just say it's a no prosecution? He said, no, that's why they're sitting on the desk. Those ones that they can say that they're not going to you know, prosecute, they've already dismissed those cases. So these are 3,000 cases that need to be addressed, that there's probably some time associated with it if they're found guilty of that crime. So because of the backlog in the district attorney's office, which is understaffed, and that's a statewide problem, you have inmates staying in the county jail longer than they typically might otherwise? We do. And we also, and, and I'm my own, I have my own self to blame for this, is we've increased our ICAC operations uh, in at Crimes Against Children, which are putting more felons in the facility, which are they're having felony charges, which means they're spending a longer time in the county jail, um, you know, facing their charges. As an alternative, John, does the county really need a jail expansion? What about other ways of keeping inmate populations down? What are those other ways, and have they been tried or put into effect? That's a great question. In 2009, the Kimmy study indicated that in 2011 that the Brown County Jail, based on statistics, should increase their jail, increase the jail pod. And that was my first year in office was 2011. And they were and already recommending it back then. They were. And, and we Kimmy said, means? Oh, I'm sorry. Kimmy was the architectural design study 
that did that designed the first jail. Okay. So what they did was they projected out, you know, the the statistical information that they had. They projected that in 2011, Brown County should be adding on to that facility to keep up with the growing number of uh, inmates that we have. Every year that I was in office, I submitted a capital improvement project to County Executive Troy Streckenbach, knowing that this was what the Kimmy study had indicated. And I said, I think we can control this a little bit better by using other means, which you had indicated. Um, at that point, we didn't have heroin court. We didn't have um, any other kind of mental health court that we have now that, that currently tries to keep the lesser offenders out of the facility and, and truly where they, where they belong, um, working with that court. So there's a lot of things that have been put into place we increased in 2011 our EMP program, which is our electronic monitoring program. So we went from about 30 inmates that we had on that program to 100 inmates. So there were 70 beds that were freed up um, in 2011 because we saw that we were trying to get constricted. So what we did was we moved those uh, to EMP. And those, once again, were lesser offenders, people that committed minor crimes that had maybe a 30, 40-day stint that had to serve. And then we put GPS bracelets on them, along with, if there was an alcohol conviction, we put scram monitors or a, a type of remote breath testing. So it would randomly give them an opportunity to blow into a remote test, almost like a cell phone, it would give the results to us in real time. So we'd be able to find out whether or not they were um, violating their, their EMP bracelet. So more electronic monitoring, more special courts. What other ways have been utilized to try to keep the jail population lower? We've got uh, treatment courts. You know, the, the Criminal Justice Coordinating Board has been very effective in looking at ways to lessen the amount of people that are in the jail. Um, but we're still looking at uh, probably we had the day report center that we've enacted um, with Brown County, and that's working through family services. So they're working with the inmates to try to make sure that they're staying off the um, – the drugs or the alcohol issues that they have going on in their lives, and then trying to work with them through treatment as opposed to putting them and locking them up in the facility. Longer term, is there anything that can be done with sentencing reform? You know, there is, and I know that David Lassay is working with the judges. Um, I know that absent the uh, 3,000 cases that we have sitting out there that are eventually going to be, be adjudicated, uh, I think that there's some opportunities for the judges and the district attorney and the public defenders to take a look and, and say, maybe some of the sentencing reform, we, we can look at different opportunities. And I know that's being done through the Criminal Justice Coordinating Board, Board and Judge Walsh. But you're saying regardless of all this, in the meantime, you still need the jail expansion. Yeah, and I'll, I'll tell you one reason why is our, our female population is jumping up. We're seeing a larger number of females that are arrested. And I think a lot of that has to do with the uh, methamphetamine and the opioid problem because Opioid addiction has no gender specific or specificity. It's um, it's affecting everybody from the affluent to the to the poor, and, and I can tell you that uh, a number of uh, individuals have committed crimes based on the fact that they're feeding that opioid addiction. So it's the lesser crimes. It might be a burglary. It might be a it might be part of a, a, a drug dealing incident um, that a drug task force is involved in. The sad state of affairs. It is. It is, and it's 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 somewhat of a cancer that's permeating not only our community, but communities throughout the nation. What would be the size of the jail expansion? We're looking at uh, adding on two direct supervision pods, so dormitory-type settings for females. What that would do, that would allow us to relieve the hotel pod, which has the 44 beds in there, and then that would open up 44 beds for indirect individuals, maybe that have the mental health issues, the AODA issues, and those are the expensive pods. Those are the uh, ones that the individual cells with the officer station. The direct supervision, we can move those females into that new direct facility, which currently we don't have the ability to move females into a large dormitory because they were never set up that way. It's, we have adult males in each four, sure. four of those. Uh, so that will allow us a little bit more, um, I guess, flexibility in how we're going to handle that population. It would also allow us then to move some of those individuals that are in the juvenile pod that is the 35 beds, into the uh, hotel pod area and then and, in, in, and maybe one of the other 62 pods for the direct supervision, that would allow us to add more juveniles and then contract with other counties for more juvenile space. And I know that that's another huge issue that we're discussing right now 
um, that was a bill in the in the, at the at the Senate and in, in the Assembly. I think I've read that the net addition would be 124 new beds. That's correct. Excuse me, <clears throat> 124 new beds. That's correct. Yeah, 124 new beds that would be in a direct supervision setting. And how much would this expansion cost? You know, they were they were tossing around a lot of numbers. There's about an eight hundred thousand dollar escalator for every year that we delay the the build out. Uh, so in eighteen, it would cost about fourteen point nine million, and in nineteen, it would cost approximately fifteen point seven million. Now, those are estimates based on what the Kimmy study had provided, uh, based on you know what that cost would be. So we don't we don't have an actual architectural design as of yet. How long, John, would you ex- estimate that this expansion would be expected to last before Brown County might need another jail expansion as the, Brown, as the county's population keeps growing? Yeah, we, we looked at the, uh, the escalations on the, uh, the, we assume the current population trend of 1% population growth per year for, or, or eight inmates. Um, with our contracted rate, um, we would look at that would probably go till about 2030 until we'd start having to look at other options or maybe another add-on, additional add-on. So about 12 years or about so? About 12 years or so. Now, the expansion would be part of Brown County's $225 million six-year capital projects plan, so the jail addition would be funded through the temporary half-cent county sales tax. That's correct. That is, that is the current plan, and I believe $20 million has been earmarked for public safety and mental health. Where is the county jail edition at today? I believe an RFP, a request for proposals for a project manager for the expansion has been sent out and a contract could be signed by April. Then what? Well, then then we'll work with that project manager that will be working for Brown County and that individual will be responsible for getting out that architectural design and getting the architects on board to find out what we need to bring up to code. The interesting thing about that jail when it was built was everything is scabbed in for add-ons. So... All the work was done prior to, so they, they had some forethought in this facility if we did have to add on. So there will be economies of scale with regard to what needs to be added on and how it needs to be done. When would you hope the new jail edition would be open? I would have liked to have been open in 2017, but I know that's not a reality. <laughs> but being a realist, it would be nice to have it open by 2020 if we could look at uh, getting this the architectural design done in 18 and the build-out in 19, hopefully at the fall of 19 or uh, begin start of 2020. Is there anything else important to add about the jail proposal? You know, I, it's the thing about the jail is it's it's not a it's not something that doesn't beautify the county. It doesn't do anything for the county. It's not a feel good thing for the county, but it's a necessity for the county. And I, the reason I say that is because nobody wants to spend money on a facility that's going to be housing criminals and um, making sure that. The public is safe, but but it is a necessity because it, it is essential that as we go on, and we're seeing more and more violent crimes, we're seeing more and more felonious uh, acts being committed, and I only see this being a, being a problem as we go into the future, and we need to be prepared for that. And Brown County is growing at a clip of about 20,000 people a decade. Yes, sir, we are, and uh, you know people need to realize that, and I, I think that the county board and I think the county executive have identified that, so... Hopefully, as we move forward, we'll be able to address those needs uh, as a community. And that's it for episode number four of the Progress Report. Thank you, John, for being on the program. Thank you, Bill. And thanks to executive producer Dan Jones, producer Jacob Jones, producer Darian Goheen, editor Christian Rivera, technician Serena Wojak. Be sure to subscribe to Political Radar on YouTube, join the Political Radar community group on Facebook, And you can support this show financially by purchasing Political Radar merchandise from our shop. For more discussion, check out Blind Partisan plus Green Bay Development News on Skyscraper City. This episode of The Progress Report was recorded February 28, 2018. Thanks for watching. See you next week.